Won't you join me in today's call to worship? Incline your ear to me, O Lord. Rescue me. Be my rock. Save me and be my place of refuge. Act as a fortress around me. Deliver me from my persecutors. Redeem me. Extract me from the troubles which have surrounded me. Let me take refuge in your steadfast love. Amen. Let us pray. Holy One, as our world continues to rock and our footing seems unsteady, we look to you for solid ground. As we gather together in worship, we ask for your abiding spirit to make herself known amongst us. Calm our fears, center our souls, gather us in under your protective tent where we might be renewed and refreshed as we sing our praises to you and give thanks for the many blessings which you have offered in our life. Amen. Let us sing together with David Caswell as he sings, Those Who Hope. May the words be as wind lifting you up.
we now feel strengthened, let us offer prayers for others. I invite you as we pray to leave prayers that you need to be said in the comments section below or message the church and we will take time to pray the prayers that you post. Let us now all pray together. Gracious and wondrous God, who birthed our world into existence, on this Mothering Sunday, we invite you to gather the hurting upon your lap. Hold each person close. Let them attune themselves and be revived by the rhythm of creation. Give each person a moment to feel your breath, to know your presence, and to remember their own belovedness as your child. As they are refreshed, give them the strength to move confidently back into the world. Holy One, we pray for the sick, the dying, the lonely, the hungry, the frightened, the disoriented, the confused, the unemployed, the underemployed, the incarcerated, the detained, the homeless, the abandoned, the disenfranchised, the abused, the orphaned, the marginalized, the lost, the corrupted, and all others who we do not know to name or how to name. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. This is Bonnie Kilgore joining you from our new home in southeastern Pennsylvania, just outside of Amish country. We are doing well here, but being very careful with our social distancing since our county is one of the top five in the state for the COVID virus. Our girls are well too. Both are still working. One works from home and one has been moved to a larger building so the employees have more room between them. Uh, we miss you all in Brimfield and pray that you all stay safe and healthy in these times. I'm pleased to share with you this morning. Our reading this week comes from the Hebrew Testament in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. It comes from the part of the story of Abraham and Sarah that we tend to try to skip over, for it's a difficult story of power, rejection, abandonment, but ultimately of survival and love. In Christianity, we gloss over this story because our eye is trained to follow lineage which will move us toward the birth of Jesus. But this is an equally important story to tell. According to Islamic tradition, it is also the point at which our faiths diverge. Abraham's son, Isaac, leading to the birth of Jesus, and Abraham's son, Ishmael, leading to the birth of Muhammad. Here now, the version of the story is found in our book of Genesis, chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham, on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman, 
Whatever Sarah tells you to do, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is the inspired word of God for the people of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The Lord says to Isaiah in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 19, I am about to do a new thing. Even now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Often we do not perceive change. Sometimes it comes at a rate imperceptible to the human eye and surprises us only in its completion. Just the other day, I was noticing the leaves coming out. Each day they are just a bit bigger than the day before. I swear some days I can almost watch them change. The magnificence of watching this miracle has left me wondering how obtuse I've been in other years. Usually, the only way that I notice the leaves coming out is the onslaught of my seasonal allergies and my need for Claritin. Usually the trees are bare and then suddenly it seems that they're all filled in. I notice the end result, but not the unfolding. This year though, this year I perceive it. I am paying attention to the details. I see the change as it is happening. And I have to assume that this is the kind of change that the Lord and Isaiah are speaking of. A change that is happening so slowly that it seems not to be happening at all. Because if it's not, and it's a time like the time that we are experiencing in the quickly changing pandemic world, then I would expect a sarcastic response from Isaiah. Like, yeah, I've noticed. How could I not? change is a very disorienting force and as a whole we humans tend to resist it. We are especially put off when change is foisted upon us without our permission. We in general appreciate predictability. We like a rhythm that we can recognize and can begin to groove with. We like clear direction. It makes us feel safe to have at least a basic understanding of where we are and where we are going. Spice and originality are better left to recipes, dancing, and fashion. In life, though, this is not always possible. Sometimes change is planned, and sometimes it jumps upon us like a cat upon its prey, leaving us disoriented and unsettled. 
Now I must say that change is not always bad. In and of itself, the concept of change is really neither positive nor negative at all. It is really the particular type of change and our reaction to that change that polarizes it as either good or bad. And honestly, it is quite possible that there's a little bit of both. Sometimes change is just what we need to catapult us into a new way of thinking or acting. Sometimes it inspires innovation and creativity. Sometimes it forces us out of a rut which we can only identify in retrospect. Imagine our life as a still pond with a surface as smooth as glass. Everything under the water stays under the water. Everything in the air stays in the air. This is a visualization of equilibrium. Everything has a place and everything is in its place. Everything is accounted for from our perspective. This state of equilibrium is a good and comfortable place to be. But then Johnny comes along and chucks a stone in the pond. The rock kerplunk hits the bottom. The surface sends out ripples in all directions and our equilibrium has been disturbed. Something has broken the tranquility of our balanced system. Fortunately, Given a few minutes, everything settles back down and returns to the way it has been. The disturbance was temporary and equilibrium returned. Now imagine someone sets a motorboat motor in the middle of our tranquil scene and pulls the cord. As the motor jumps to life, it spits and turns the water, and the water turns the mud on the bottom of the lake, and the engine sends smoke into the atmosphere. The disturbance is maintained and has become a more permanent disruption to an otherwise calm and balanced scene. If this continues on and on and on, the birds and the bees and the bugs and the fish and the other life will have to figure out how to adjust and adapt to accommodate this disruption. Some will accomplish this task. They will adapt and innovate. Others that refuse to change will either have to migrate to a new place or frankly, be overwhelmed and perish. Survival of the flora and fauna would no doubt rely on each entity's willingness and ability to experiment and change. Sometimes when we don't know what to do, we have to be willing to try, fail, take notice of what worked and what didn't, and then try again. As one comes up with a successful plan, others would catch on or be taught these new ways also. For example, ducks might have to find and create new ways to land on churning water. As these new styles of landing at first might seem odd and awkward, but this adaptation would soon become the norm. As this new way of being moves from an oddity to an expected norm, a new coherence would begin to emerge, a new normal. The frothy turning of the waters would be the new and accepted way of being. At that point, this so-called way of being would only be new until another point of change came along and it becomes the old, giving way to yet another new. Susan Beaumont, the author of Leading in a Liminal Time and a church consultant, suggests that there are five practices for coaxing order out of chaos. She encourages the engaging of emergence by fostering experiments, embracing failure, replacing repetition with iteration, naming what is rising, and waiting for simplicity on the other side of complexity. Disturbance and disruption leads to innovation. Why can't we see the new thing which God is doing? Because we have been taught to see disturbance and disruption as bad and have been encouraged to avoid them at all cost. We react to disruption and disturbance by recoiling backward or jumping over the opportunities it creates. 
we are too busy being disoriented to be willing to consider anything else. Too busy catching our breath from the change to begin to imagine what might be possible. Too busy holding on to what was to consider what is, let alone what might be. Too angry at our loss to be intrigued by what is about to be born. Too anxious to return to our calm and predictable equilibrium to allow for any other ideas to enter the pool of possibilities. Ed Catmull, the founder and creator of Pixar says, there is a sweet spot between the known and the unknown where originality happens. The key is to be able to linger there without panicking. Disturbance, disorientation and disruption are invitations to birth a new thing. They are indicators of the opportunity to co-create with God. Unfortunately, as Susan Beaumont points out, the natural human response is to resist liminality, that is the threshold of change into an unknown space and to strive backward to an old familiar identity or forward to an unknown identity. She implies that there is value to sitting in chaos, a blessing to accepting liminality for a time. She introduces the possibility that neither returning back nor pretending we know where we are going is a preferred stance and in fact helpful to our development to go back to our pond metaphor. When someone throws a rock in the serene surface, we are angered at the disturbance, but tell them not to do it again and happily retreat back to where we were. When they put that motor in, we are outraged and threaten all sorts of no trespassing and anti-noise and pollution statutes. In our outrage, we fail to notice the good that is happening. We fail to notice that the churning water is breaking up the algae, aerating the water, and breathing new life into the ecosystem. Perhaps such a large motor in a small pond is not a great idea. But if we willingly stopped and noticed what was happening, we might have seen some beneficial possibilities that were being born right before our very eyes. Stagnation breeds stagnation. Change has a potential to create opportunity. And if we can tolerate the discomfort that it may cause and are willing to consider experimenting with something new, then that is where possibility is born. Susan Beaumont says, all significant transitional experiences follow a predictable three-part process something comes to an end. There is an in-between season marked by disorientation, disidentification, and disengagement. And then finally, and often after a long and painful struggle, something new emerges. Interestingly, another church consultant, Carrie Newhoff, says that crisis is an accelerator the changes that we see do not come out of nowhere, but instead reveal and amplify the weaknesses that were already there and accelerate trends that were emerging anyway. Change should be greeted warmly with a note of, I've been expecting you, and with a hint of curiosity. In our story that we heard Bonnie read to us today, we are thrust into the point of disorientation. Likewise, we personally are living in this segment of time. Life as we knew it has changed. That is clear. Hagar and Ishmael are sent into the desert. They are exiled from their community with only a few provisions, and these provisions quickly run out. And we too have been pushed from our predictable lives into an unknown place. Notice, notice in the story of Ishmael and Hagar that the story doesn't end in this space of fear and discomfort. Instead, a new life unfolds in front of them. In separating from their own clan, they are pushed to a new land where opportunities await. 
where new nations, as God promised, are set to be established. Had they not left the old, the new would have never been born. In our lives, too, new ways are emerging. Innovation abounds around us. Routines are changing, and people are trying new things every day. Some of those things will flourish, and some will fail. But ingenuity is certainly at hand. We are in a time ripe with possibility. You may have heard some people say, or you may have even said yourself, I just want things to go back to the way they were. This isn't really possible, though. The world has changed, and truth be told, so have we. And so perhaps the question that is now before us is not how do we go back, but given the changes that we have experienced personally and communally, what is God asking me to do now? What is God asking us to do now? Hagar could have tried to return to Abraham and Sarah, but that probably would not have been advisable for her or her son. They could have curled up and waited for death to come upon them, which is kind of what it sounds like they did. But then where would we have been? It is God who prods them. Get up! Get up! I have plans for you! Get up and join me! Let's go create something new! I think here is the message for us too today. Going back is not really possible. Too much has transpired and things weren't perfect anyway. So let's imagine with God. Let's create with God. What might a world look like where the welfare of all was a priority? What would the world look like where all people were safe? What would the world look like where justice reigned? What would the world look like where equality and equity were the standard? We are on the precipice of possibility. This is a time of opportunity. This is a time of potential transformation. Something new and beautiful can be born out of the pain that we've experienced, at least it could be if we were willing to tolerate the discomfort of unknowing what the outcome would be exactly and the discomfort of not exactly being sure how to accomplish the task. If we were able to allow ourselves to sit, to dream, to plan, to reflect, to create, to notice. If we were willing to neither return to the past nor rush headlong into the future, if we could stay in this disequilibrium and welcome it, then perhaps we could have the possibility to envision and begin to enact something new. Perhaps if we could look with wonder and were willing to work with God, we could create something that we only dream of now. Perhaps we could perceive that something new that the Lord spoke to Isaiah about and help to move that vision along. In my house, there is a coffee cup that says, what would you attempt to do if you could not fail? And so I pose that question to you. Since change is already at hand, what might you dare to create? How might you partner with God today? How might we as a church body partner with God? I, for one, look forward to seeing what you and we do together. Let's be brave. Let's co-create with God. Amen. And now on this Mother's Day Sunday, I invite you to hear this blessing that was written by Jan Richardson. You can find it on sanctuaryofwomen.com or janrichardson.com. Open your heart and hear these words. 
blessing the mothers who are our first sanctuary, who fashion a space of blessing with their own being, with the belly and bone and the blood, or if not with these, then with the durable heart that offers itself to break and grow wide, to gather itself around another as refuge, as home who lean into the wonder and terror of loving what they can hold but cannot contain, who remain in some part of themselves always awake, a corner of consciousness keeping perpetual vigil, who know that the story is what endures, is what binds us, is what runs deeper even than blood. And so they spin them in celebration of what abides and benediction on what remains a simple gladness that latches on to us and graces us on our way. And as a gift for all of you who have acted in a mothering way, may you gather a virtual bouquet of flowers as we listen or sing to the song For the Beauty of the Earth. Gather these flowers and store them in your heart. you to join me in blessing each and every one of us that joins together right now in worship and those who might watch this later. If you would lift up your hands to whatever screen is before you and join me in this blessing and benediction, repeating after me. Neighbor, I bless you. As you go out into the world, may the spiritual nutrients that we have shared today sustain you. May you remember the love of God which surrounds you always. May you recall your innate belovedness. And together, with the help of God, may we work to make the world a better and more just place. Go now with the peace and love of God into the world. Amen.